whatever oh, yeah. next year looks like, online teaching or, Zoom or, or some version of this is still going to be a part of it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. One of, one of the first dates that Sarah and I went on, I told her the story of the Japanese hornet, which is now known in America as the murder hornet. Uh, this is what, 15 years ago? But um, I found the sort of evolution of Japanese honeybees and the Japanese hornet really fascinating and that was when she knew she was dating a nerd and that we would get along well so we're not but neither of us are happy to hear that they are in the u.s because they do they devastate uh american honeybee populations because the american honeybee has not evolved at all how to defend itself against the murder hornets and uh, the Japanese honeybees have. They've actually, over time, they've developed a defense, uh, a hive-based defense that allows them to, uh, to, to try and prevent the, the hornets from finding their hive, basically. This is like ants, in a way. How so? Because the murder hornets are like the grasshoppers, and then the honeybees are the ants. The movie, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, they decapitate them and they just like, just devastate entire nests at a time. Yeah. It's like, let's, let's train like a squad of honey badgers to only kill um, murder hornets. If you can find their hives, right, that's the main technique that I, at least the little reading I've done on it, the main technique they're trying to use to prevent them from spreading is they're, they're trying to track their hives by tracing once they, once they find one, right, or once they get a murder hornet in a trap, right, a live trap, they're trying to tag them and release them and follow them back to their hives. Mm -hmm. And that, because the only way you're going to stop them is if you can find their hives. And they're so, so big, why don't you just attach like a little leash to them? Well, that's the thing. They are so big, you can actually attach like a, a colored, like a bright colored string and just follow them. Because they're so big, they can carry the weight. <laughs> Where are these located in the U.S.? On the West Coast. Yeah, luckily for us, this is all uh, Washington State, Vancouver, like, like the Southwest Canada, Northeast U.S. Well, I know we're not to go now. The only reason. Well, but uh, again, that those were the first cases of coronavirus were in the Pacific Northwest. And we see what happened. So it's like. Thanks, Dutton. <laughs> <laughs> we know that things can move quickly, especially because air travel is still a thing because yep. we are still, we still have flights. And if you've seen any pictures of people, selfies yeah. uh, on those flights, they are packed, despite the fact that, that the airlines promised, no, we're just gonna sell one seat per row or no middle seats or whatever, they are packed. Yeah. It's, it's a flying picture. I saw like one that was like, like one person on the whole entire plane and then, yeah, and that happens occasionally when they have to get a plane back to the original destination. Yeah. Oh, dang. But anything where people are like, no, we, you know, this is a New York to Chicago flight or something. Like, you know, those are, those are always going to be packed. Okay. So given that we have talked about everything except for soil. Um, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to call it. Let's talk about some soil. Root soil. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the transition. Is that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the food production system a lot in the context of coronavirus. Talking about the supply chain. Uh, farmers being able to produce things and uh, then not being able to sell them, right? Um, and where, you know, people are starting their gardens. I know that, you know, my wife and I, we started immediately on how are we going to garden? 
Uh, how are we going to make sure that we're producing the most amount of produce so that, you know, we don't have to go out as much or if supply chains collapse and we can't get fresh produce, how do we make sure we're growing it ourselves? Um, <laughs> I like the burying the myrrh or the harness in the soil. Um, so I, I think it's, it's definitely worthwhile to understand this piece, especially as, as we move forward. And, and, you know, if you have space to garden, um, if you, or if you have access to a community garden, there are lots around Cleveland, um, you know, being able to apply this knowledge that you have uh, to best be able to produce some, you know, food from your fam for your family or for yourselves. Uh, so I think that's how I want you understanding soil. That's how we want you understanding uh, these different issues so that you can be prepared for this and you can, you know, maybe contribute a little bit more uh, to, to your whole community. Um, I know that I'm gonna have my, I'm gonna invite my neighbors to pick berries. We've got lots of berries on our property. Um, just, you know, as a good like neighborhood bonding experience. We'll stay away <laughs> while they <laughs> pick, but still a kind of bonding experience. Speaking of, of community enrichment, just a quick shout out uh, to Ayana for the pop-up classroom. I thought that was pretty cool. Yep, yep, so Thursday, 11 o'clock, right? Yeah. I thought she was going to be like, yeah. I think she's muted and she doesn't know it. That's, that could be a slogan or a band name. Muted and we didn't know it? Very quiet band. Yeah. Just very sleepy music. Uh -oh. They're all trumpets. Um, Nothing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Syed will be uh, leading us again in yoga. It's very active yoga. I know this previously said like chair yoga, bed yoga. It's very active. Uh, last week uh, was a definite workout, um, just like the week before. This is a. Several breaks. <laughs> what was that? I took several breaks. I'm like, ah, I'm going to get some water. <laughs> uh, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Come to the yoga. It's amazing. You feel really refreshed afterwards. And if I don't want to take too much time, but I will be reaching out uh, to people to see if this is something that you guys would like to continue through the summer um, and what that might look like. So we've only, what do we have? Three more weeks? This is, yes, after this week, there are two more weeks. And yeah. the last week is short. Yeah, so we've got three weeks of yoga left because we still have one this week, this Wednesday. But um, I'm gonna be talking with Ms. Syed, and, but I also need feedback from you guys to see if that's something people would be interested in. So keep an eye out for that uh, short survey, probably through Google Classroom, if history is an indicator. And so here's our calendar. Um, here's what we're doing. Uh, I, I'm not in a hurry today because 5.3 is relatively short. I've got a couple good graphics for us to really help make sure that we understand 5.3. Um, and then the rest of this week are soil presentations. Um, I'll introduce to you what the expectation is for the soil type presentation is. Uh, and then on Friday is when you'll actually present them. Um, and then we'll uh, review topic five next week and start on our portfolios, which you'll get more information about next week. And, um, and that, that'll take us to the end of the year. So really, we can, we can see the end of the year from here. It's a good thing. Um, Y'all are doing an awesome job. Um, and so, like I said, today we'll go over 5.3. And um, by Sunday, we want to see questions at 5.3 and the lecture notes that you took last Friday. Any questions about that? Just to make sure we haven't lost anyone, um, quick, uh, let, us, let us know, guys, uh, if, if no one responds, I'm going to assume you want to add like a three-hour exam in there right at the end of the year, like three-hour summative final. I've already uh, got it written. It actually, it's actually written for five hours, but, you know, we can cram it into three. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you guys don't want to do that, could you let us know? Y'all can stop that right now. No, it's <laughs> not. Okay. No. All right, Mr. Dunn, there's still right. a you put that out, I ain't doing it. 
Just my wand will take it then. It yeah. magically disappear. I'm like, what happened? I'm in mean, my dog ate it. <laughs> I may have lost my virtual homework from the um computer, no, but I can still hear. I came back. The dog ate my virtual homework. <laughs> dog ate my Chromebook. Oh, my wand is awake. Look at that. <laughs> hey. Awake with a lot of no. I just hear no. <laughs> All right, so let's talk soil. Um, so in 5.3, there's just a few important concepts. Honestly, there, there's a few things that um, are new. A lot of them are a rehash of previous sections or previous units. Um, again, this is why I think topic five is the best one to have last, because it really encapsulates a lot of different things that we're talking about. Um, and <laughs> if we actually had school, we could explore soils. Um, in any case, the, there is this idea of succession. And Mr. Tao, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, okay. I'm just kind of moving things along. <laughs> um, so, so there is this idea of succession, and we did see this idea of succession um, in other units. But this idea of succession just focuses on the soil. So as you see here, um, when you start with bare rock, uh, then there's, there's no soil. There's no opportunity for anything to, anything to grow that we commonly associate with um, an organism in the soil. However, there are pioneer species that will be able to break up lichens and moss that will actually be able to, uh, be able to break up that rock. And once that rock is broken up a little bit by these pioneer species, um, the decomposition of those pioneer species creates this little thin layer of topsoil and then you get more of those pioneer species deeper down in that soil that are breaking up the rock at the same time as you have grasses and other um, primary successors actually growing and displacing those pioneer species and then you know it just gets bigger and bigger over time. Um, but the important thing to understand about this succession is that uh, there are lots of organisms that are working together. Uh, what are some other organisms in that soil that are working together in order to create that fertile soil? So what are some of these decomposers? What are some of these other organisms that are working together in the soil? can also think about it as worms. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, moles. Oh, Anything good. that lives in soil. Yep. And eats the soil. Yep. So I'm going to say small mammals because you got moles, shrews, mice. Ah, bacteria. Good. Good job, Mr. Tout. <laughs> Root. What else? If you dig down in the soil, what else do you see? Don't just think about animals either. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, so we're talking about organisms, right? So yes, you absolutely see minerals, but organisms. What? breaks down those minerals or absorbs them. I think Mr. Tout was really trying to get to the root of the matter. God, people. Yes. <laughs> so, so the plants extend their roots, right? There you go. I think the problem was it was too obvious. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. 
So there are other, like, you know, there are insects and um, things like isopods, like uh, potato bugs, right? <clears throat> um, millipedes, you have all, all these things that are actually, uh, so, so you have lots of insects that like to bury themselves uh, in, order to, in order to overwinter over the soil, in, in the soil. And um, they, in so doing, in burying themselves in the soil, they create these pockets of air. Um, and that air allows other organisms to do their thing, to, um, to do, to breathe, to do respiration. Um, so all these organisms are working together in this really great symbiosis. Um, and so healthy soil contains all those things. All right, and this part right here, plants extending their roots, that leads to resistance to what? And it's over there on the left. What, what part of happy soil are we talking about? I think Mr. Chow could break it down for you too. Or is that too esoteric a reference? I mean, I, I think it's an, a pretty amazing that you all have been able to weather the storm of puns. Your confidence in me should be uh, going away. Wind and water does what? Does what to soil? Sorry, yeah, that was. There we go. Awesome. There we go. So plants extend their roots and that offers resistance to soil erosion. You can think of those roots. I'll wait a second as I think I'm in and out. Um, you can think of those roots as, as holding all of that soil in place uh, because it does. And so the more plants you have, the less soil erosion you're gonna have the more other plants you're gonna be able to have. It's a, it's a positive feedback loop, right? The more plants you have, the more plants you can have. The less plants you have, then the less plants you're going to be able to have because that soil is going to erode. So, um, human activities that can reduce soil fertility. Um, what do we mean by deforestation? What is that in, in simple words, simple terms? Feel free to unmute or uh, throw your answer in the chat. Awesome. How about intensive grazing? Thanks, my Yeah, good job, Elena. Intensive grazing, what's that? Offer, offer explanations of any of these. <clears throat> oh yeah, awesome. When a farmer doesn't let the land recover from uh, grazing livestock, yeah. Land doesn't recover from grazing. Uh, and I'm extending cows to livestock because it's more than just cows that graze, but yeah, absolutely. Urbanization, irrigation, monoculture. These are important terms to understand. Most of them you're already very familiar with.
There, I got this one. All right, so. Can anyone turn my answer in? It's done, we'll write down. <laughs> Monoculture growing on crop. Awesome, great job. There you go. Can anyone translate my answer into a one Mr. Dutton will actually write down for urbanization? Awesome. So when cities uh, take up more land, less arable soil, $5 right there. I have a check. My mom wrote me a check. Does that count? <laughs> That's money. Yes, that counts. I hope the messages that, that you guys send to each other are more mature than the messages that Mr. Tout and I send with each other. Highly doubt that, but. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Okay, irrigation. When you irrigate something, what are you adding to it? Yay! So, uh, when you grow one crop, um, at this point, it should be you should have a good understanding of why that's bad. Um, go ahead, throw in the chat why that's why monoculture is bad. All right, urbanization. You identified why that's bad. Uh, intensive grazing, you identified why that's bad. Deforestation, you identified why that's bad. Um, irrigation, I think, is the one that's difficult to understand why it's bad. Um, but there are a couple big issues here. Again, if you can identify why monoculture is bad, go ahead, throw that in the chat. Um, but Mr. Tout is helping you out here. Uh, one of the issues is that there are small amounts of salt in irrigation water that accumulate, right? And that leads to salinization. And as we know, more salt equals bad soil. Um, irrigation also leads to water waste. So it's, it's a less direct impact but lots of irrigation techniques. Thank you, Ayana. Excellent. Yep. Um, and so lots of irrigation techniques lead to water just sitting on the surface of the soil and then evaporating. Um, and that water is just essentially wasted. Uh, water doesn't go to the plant roots mm. um, and doesn't end up having any sort of contribution. Um, and if I, to highlight uh, water waste, it's, I think it's hard, you know, this, this unit is hard in many ways because obviously we're all urban folk, we're not farmers. So it's hard to talk about soil in a knowledgeable way, right? It's a little bit outside our area. The same thing is true with water waste. We live near the Great Lakes. We happen to be in a very water wealthy area. But 
For context, guys, a lot of our crops are grown in the Southwest where water is actually relatively limited. Uh, my best friend from high school lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he, uh, he measures out water for everything he does. He doesn't just wash his dishes. You know, he like makes a very small tub of water and measures out what, like he keeps plants around his house and he knows exactly how much water he measures them. They don't have grass because, you know, they have basically, uh, they have like a rock and cactus front yard. But, you know, we're growing crops in those areas. So not specifically in obviously in Albuquerque, but we're growing crops in Southern California. We're, you know, and in the Southwest. So water is limited and irrigation systems that are inefficient and that waste water are a major problem because they're, they're running out of water and they're, uh, they are literally like their their local governments are restricting how much water they can use. So you know you start seeing, especially in particularly dry times, they'll start getting. Um, what's the word for when you put a limit on something for people? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, they have water quotas. Quotas. Um, they also have. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, though. But so anyways, uh, I think it's easy for us to think water waste, who really cares? You know, if I take a five minute shower or if my shower is five minutes longer than it would have been, right? In Ohio, it doesn't feel like that's a big deal. Whereas in drier areas where a lot of this irrigation is happening. Yeah. No, go ahead. I, I was going to. Being in being inefficient with your water is a major problem because there's only so much water to go around. So the Central Valley in California, um, to, to kind of put this into context for you, uh, the Oregon border is up here at the top. This is San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Oakland, San Francisco rather. Um, and then the doo -doo 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 -doo, LA is like down here-ish, LA, San Diego. So the Central Valley is enormous, all right? And it is bordered by the Sierra Nevada mountains right here. And the Sierra Nevada mountains um, accumulate snow over the course of the um, you know, fall, winter, and then in the spring, all that snow melts and it innervates um, all of these rivers uh, leading to the Sacramento River, which is the major one. Um, and if you remember the Hatch Hatchie debate, the San Joaquin River, all right? Um, and like also the Tolumne River is somewhere around here. So all of those, um, all, all of this innervation of rivers leads to the most fertile soil in the United States which is the, the Central Valley. Um, despite the fact that there's desert right over here, okay, this right here is the most uh, fertile soil in the United States. And 60% of our crops come from the Central Valley. Now, if you have been paying attention, you know that, um, you know that there has been a drought in California the better part of the last like five, six years. And that drought is affecting, of course, their ability to farm. Um, and that is directly related to climate change because there's less snow falling on these mountains. Uh, there's more rain falling on these mountains. And so it doesn't create enough water in the spring uh, for there to be this, uh, this fertile soil, um, having enough water and having enough natural irrigation um, because they don't have a huge body of water that they can draw clean, um, fresh water from. Obviously they have the ocean, but you would have to desalinate that. So, uh, and then there's the Colorado River, which some part of Southern California has access to, uh, but not a lot. Um, and so there are aqueducts and canals that have been built in order to try to distribute water throughout the Central Valley. Um, but this is a huge issue, uh, especially when it comes to irrigation. And to answer Ayana's question about drip irrigation, drip irrigation is that is when you have uh, very small 
like straw, straw-like um, hoses that lead directly to the plants. And so they actually, you know, you have plant by plant watering. Um, and entire farms often run on drip irrigation, especially in areas where water is scarce. So uh, a little tangent, but a really helpful one for understanding uh, where we get our produce in the United States and how important it is that that soil fertility stays up and also the irrigation issues. Um, so yeah, water, especially in the Southwest United States is, is a huge, huge challenge. Okay, so uh, commercialized industrialized food production uh, systems. So they, when you're talking about these industrialized food production systems, you're talking about not using drip irrigation, okay? Uh, drip irrigation is, is something that is um, very uh, expensive to roll out. And if you're running an industrialized food production system, you just want to get stuff watered uh, as cheaply as possible. Um, so they're not using smart irrigation techniques. So they're not irrigating well. Um, they are also uh, not practicing crop rotation, right? So they are only growing that one crop over and over and over again. Um, it's much cheaper to do all of that, okay? Uh, it's much cheaper to use, as Ayana said, all these pesticides and herbicides rather than using a more environmentally friendly option. Um, and these things, these herbicides, they kill off all those little plants that are holding that soil together. And so they reduce that soil fertility by increasing erosion. Uh, they also kill off a lot of the bugs, a lot of the insects. And those insects are necessary in order to keep the soil healthy. Uh, soil is a system. It's not just a bunch of dirt. All right. So, um, and then when you compare that with the subsistence farming methods, small scale subsistence farming methods, um, that's like me and my garden, right? I'm going to, I'm going to pull the weeds manually. All right. And then I'm not using any pesticides. I'm not using any herbicides. Uh, so I'll, I'll also, you know, pull the insects manually. Um, I'm going to have all sorts of techniques as the garden goes on uh, to prevent um, to prevent pests from actually uh, eating my food before I get to it. So you know, all this stuff it's it's labor intensive, um, and that's what the big farms are trying to avoid: is labor intense stuff. And finally. I'll make sure that I'm rotating my crops even within the same season. So I might grow something in, in one place and, and I might harvest it in June. And then I'll start to grow something else that's in a completely different family of crops uh, in June so that I can harvest it in August or September. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of different um, ways that smaller scale farming, small scale subsistence farming uh, is way more efficient. So this erosion piece, um, there are lots of different types of erosion. And we haven't talked about these different types, but I think if I mention them real quick, it'll make sense. You don't have to know them, um, but just understanding that erosion doesn't just happen when water hits soil. It happens a lot of different ways. Um, there is something called splash erosion, which is a raindrop. When it hits the, the soil, it's violent. Um, on a micro scale, it's a very violent reaction. And it actually pushes soil out of the way when that raindrop hits the soil. Um, now, if you're talking about a sprinkle or a mist or something like that, uh, that is less violent, right? But a heavy rainstorm can cause significant damage to the soil. Um, there's also real ero erosion, which is kind of like a little river popping up in the soil. Um, a gully is like a, a, um, a canyon. Uh, it's a larger 
uh, river, it goes all the way down to um, sea level, essentially, it can. Um, so gullies are huge, rills are smaller. And then there's sheet erosion, which is the top level of the soil all moving off, sloughing off all at once. That often happens uh, in a flood or when there's a large amount of precipitation all at the same time. All right, a lot of landslide, exactly. Uh, so, so when you have that reduced soil fertility, all right, when you have the, the urbanization or you have the lack of plants that the, the roots are not holding everything in, then you get all of these other effects, okay? Questions about that? Thank you. All right, the last piece is how do we actually reduce the soil loss? And, um, you know, we talked a lot about this on Friday, but here are some different pictures. And I think um, these pictures combined with the pictures that you saw on Friday really help to ground this in reality. Um, you see the strip cropping. Strip cropping um, is where you have a strip of a different crop, and this is kind of a way to do your crop rotation um, and have different crops on the same soil. And it helps to soak up rain and slow the runoff. So if you have some things that are growing and some other things that are mature, then it helps to balance out your fields. Uh, we see the terracing prevents runoff. Um, as Mr. Todd explained on Friday, your, the terrace is all on one level. And then no-till planting, we didn't talk, I don't, did we talk about this, Mr. Todd? I didn't meant to, but we were getting short on time, so I think I zoomed over that. Pun not intended. <laughs> so when you till the soil, what you're doing is you're plowing the soil under, and you're taking anything that's alive uh, or dead organic matter, and you're putting it on the bottom of the soil, which makes a lot of sense because that prevents weeds. It also allows that dead organic matter to become a part of the soil a little bit faster. However, what, what it also does is it disrupts the natural structure of the soil because it gets rid of those roots. So tilling can be good every so often, but if you do it a lot, then it's bad. So no-till planting is a way to just, you, you say, nope, not gonna till the soil. I'm just gonna leave the dead plants on top of the soil. The roots are gonna hold the soil in place and I'm just going to be really intensive about my removal of weeds, physical removal of weeds, instead of just plowing everything under. Um, we did talk about windbreaks and contour cropping is kind of like terracing. Um, and then there are cover crops, which are a way of um, planting crops on the soil that you're not necessarily going to harvest, but that are gonna cover the soil over to prevent erosion, All right? Questions about 5.3. We'll hit the question set real quick. So there are only three questions for the question set. You notice that one of them is six marks, the first one. And we just covered over all this stuff. So, but that six mark question means that you have to outline quite a bit, quite a bit of human activities. Um, because it's an outline and you're giving a brief account or a summary and it's six marks, I would shoot for at the very least three different human activities. Um, because you identify the ac activity and then give a brief account or summary of that activity. I think personally that would be worth two marks for each activity if you did that. So desertification is a major environmental concern. State two soil conservation measures. 
state. Just give them, all right? And you get one mark for each of them. And then identify one method of reducing soil loss. Okay, they're giving you two marks for that. And it does say identify, provide an answer from a number of possibilities. Um, it's interesting that, that it's a two mark question. I would definitely do a little bit of explanation. I wouldn't waste my time on a thorough explanation, but give a little bit of explanation of that method to make sure that the reader knows that I understand it since it's two marks. Yeah, so I was gonna, I was gonna highlight that as well. Guys, this, it, what Mr. Dutton is teaching right now is test taking strategies, right? And these are gonna allow for time management. So just be aware, right? When, when you read a question like number two, and it says state two things and we'll give you two points, that's a question you could answer with two words, right? Bullet point, first word, second bullet point, second word, done, right? They're not asking you to write a paragraph. For the second one, recognizing they want you to identify one thing, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'm just gonna put down one word. But just recognizing, like, am I really gonna get two points for writing down one word? Probably not. So maybe I need to add a sentence, right? And so just recognizing like, oh, I can get two points if I just say some more stuff about that word, right? How do I explain or, or give a little bit more information on that word, largely just to show someone I know what that word means, right? Those two and three are, are a little bit different than number one, right? Where number one, recognize this is worth six points. I should probably be giving them some, some I should be flushing out my ideas, right? If, if you just write one, two, three, and then list three human activities, one, two, three, like three words, you know you're not getting full credit for that first question, right? <clears throat> But if you can talk about each one, you're probably going to get two points for that one. So the word itself, right, if we give one example, right, one example of soil degradation by human activity, overgrazing, right? Overgrazing by itself is not going to get you two points, but the word itself might get you one point. And then you can get the second point by talking about what overgrazing is. Anyway. These are important test taking skills, guys. All right. We are just about done. So um, tomorrow we will start those soil type presentations and, and we'll give you, and you, you can already see it on Classroom, um, and we'll talk about what appropriate soil types are to choose. Um, hoping this will be actually a really interesting project for you and not all that difficult. You should be able to um, put it together in the hour that we have together, no problem. Um, and then we should have some, uh, we should have a good time presenting them because you know we'll get to see each other a little bit. So it's good. Uh, hopefully the weather warms up a little bit um, by the time we see you next and you'll be able to spend a little bit of that time outside. Stay healthy and safe. And we will see you tomorrow. Thank you, guys.